I know there's a lot more that I'm missing. Please pray one for another. Pray for healing one for another. And for God to, uh, just God to move and God to be glorified. You know, I, I thank God for the uh, a message that, you know, God gave us through our sister. Because it's really kind of the message I'm going to, a little bit of the message I'm going to preach this morning. If I can remember it. Uh, we, uh, Rose and I, thank you for praying for us. We, we just got back from the camp meeting, state camp meeting. <laughs> And uh, Todd and Shane were there also, and we uh, were blessed with some really good teaching and preaching, some, some great teachers. And, and the, the emphasis of the Church of God, uh, with, we have a new overseer. Some of you know, you met him last year. Brother Bell was here for our anniversary. He's going to be here this year on October 14th. That's a Friday evening. Uh, Dr. Bell's going to be here. A great man of God. And he has a passion for just what the Lord spoke to us this morning for evangelism, a passion to reach out. You know, I grew up in a church where church was the end in itself. How many people know what I'm talking about? Well, you go to church because that's what you do. It's church. It's Sunday. You go to church. So, uh, and, and, you know, there's a lot of churches like that. You can go to a church and they say, well, it's Sunday, so we go to church. But do we understand the purpose? A, a, lot, of, a lot don't. You know, it's good to come together. When, when you read about the early church in the book of Acts, it says that they, they studied the apostles' doctrine and they fellowshiped together. They broke bread together. They, uh, they, they shared things with each other. Uh, it also says that uh, the Lord moved in their midst. The Spirit moved and people were being saved daily. Okay? Coming to church isn't just about coming to church. It's good to fellowship and good to have picnics and luncheons and all these things. And we could pray with each other and encourage each other. But what's more important is that we come in here to be equipped to go out there. I've, I've said that, and I, I, that's a, a theme that I continue to repeat because this isn't the end. This isn't, we don't come to church just to come to church. If you're just coming here, you know, because it's a thing to do on Sunday morning, there's more. Is, there's a reason for this. Uh, Jesus Christ said he came to save sinners. And he expects us to have that same kind of heart. Now, uh, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me. We, we hear some really good teaching and preaching. And whenever you go to these camp meetings, uh, they, the, the people up there speaking will always say, well, you know, this will preach, you know. So they, they kind of give you permission to say stuff that they said. But I want you to turn with me, first of all, to uh, Matthew chapter 22. Chapter 22. And uh, I want you to read something with me, and we're going to move on. Uh, This was, uh, Matthew chapter 22 is taking place the very last week of Jesus' life before his crucifixion, the Passion Week. Just a few days before his crucifixion. And if you read the Gospel accounts, that last week... Jesus was under such intense pressure. He was under such intense, uh, intense attack from the religious leaders of that time because uh, they knew things were coming to a head. The Passover was coming and things were coming to a head. And they were trying to do everything they could to get Jesus to say something or do something that they would be able to point to and say, you see, uh, see, he's not, he's not the Messiah. They, 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 they were trying to... Uh, Trick him in his own words, as it were. So, uh, in Matthew chapter 22, and starting with verse 41. No, I'm sorry. Starting in verse 34. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, what is the great commandment in the law? What is the most important commandment in the law? What's the, what's the greatest thing? And most of us know the answer. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So you can take the whole of the Old Testament, because when Jesus was speaking about the law and the prophets and the scriptures, he was talking about the Old Testament. The New Testament had not been 
written. Okay? So, all that Old Testament, the, all the books in the Old Testament, it's kind of big, it's kind of thick, and there's all kinds of stuff in there. You can all sum it up with two basic statements. Love God and love people. Love God and love people. Uh, one, of the, one of the men speaking this last week said, you know, this Christian thing, it's like, it's like a two-sided thing. You have what we believe and how we behave. Okay? What we believe and how we behave. Love God, love people. It's like a train running on tracks. You know, a train, Sister Lil just took a train trip to Chicago a few weeks ago. And that train has two tracks it's running on. And if one of those tracks is gone, what's going to happen? The train is going to derail. This Christian life that we claim to be living and are living has two sides. It's what we believe and it's how we behave. Love God, love people. Our relationship with God based on our faith and what this Word says and our relationship to one another based on the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. See, we have a tendency sometimes to either emphasize one or the other. If we emphasize what we believe, and we have doctrine, 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 and doctrine's important, you know that. We, we strive to preach the doctrine and the Word of God. It's important to learn and to understand. That's important. Learning God's Word and studying God's Word is so important. But some people, that's all they deal with. They deal with what we believe and don't bother with how we behave. The Pharisees were like that. The Pharisees, they had it all down. They had their religion. They had their teaching. They had it all down pat. But they weren't living the law of love that Jesus talked about. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, strength, mind, so forth. Love your neighbor as yourself. The Pharisees didn't love anybody. They, they believed they had the word. They had, all, they had all the commandments and they tried to follow them to a T. But when Jesus came, they tried to kill him. There's some folks that can quote you scriptures out of the Bible. Backwards and forwards. But boy, don't you cross them. Or don't you dare. Don't you dare question something that they think. You know, some folks have their pet doctrines, and I'm not talking about the essentials of the faith, you know, blood atonement and all that stuff. That's, those things are important. But, you know, some folks, hey, they have their pet doctrines. And, man, if you start crossing them on that, boy, you've got a fight on your hand. They're going to be right no matter what. Now, Brother Albert knows what I'm talking about. He was a preacher's kid. <laughs> you know, you get, you, get into, you, get a, you get a preacher fight going, boy, it can be pretty rough. Because they, they know so much about doctrine. They got the belief thing right. But they don't have, they, they haven't learned how to behave. You ever tell your kid, behave? Sometimes God looks down at us and says, behave. Sometimes we do that. Sometimes we focus on the behavior and don't worry about the doctrine. That, that turns into religious legalism. How many of us have known uh, people, and I've, I've known people who were raised in churches where they had, they had rules. They had rules. In fact, I was raised in a church where they had rules. And they had a way you did things like this. They gave you a little book. And you stood up when you were supposed to stand up and sit down when you were supposed to. And they had a, and you, and if you, if you got out of line, somebody was going to, your parent would reach over and smack you. And usher would come around and say, hey. And it had to be exactly like that. But they never taught you why. So you had to behave, the behavior, but you didn't know what you believed. You know, there's a lot of people that sit in churches today and don't know what they believe. But I hope nobody in here can say, man, I don't know what I believe. You might not know everything about everything in the Bible, but I hope at least you know some things. How can we go out and tell people about Jesus Christ if we don't know about it? How can we tell them what we believe if we don't even know ourselves what we believe? I, some people get themselves in trouble. Don't go out and start witnessing to people until you know what you believe. But there's what we believe and how we behave. Love the Lord your God with all your, your heart and strength and mind according to what this Word says and love your neighbor as yourself. In another Gospel, Jesus said that and somebody asked him, well, Jesus, who's my neighbor? Well, you've got to watch when you ask a question like that. 
Jesus told the story about the Good Samaritan. We all know that story. How the man was, a man was taken by robbers and he was laying on the side of a ditch. And the priest came by and said, well, I can't touch him. It's against the rules. And Levi came by and says, well, I've got to be somewhere. But the Samaritan came by who was his enemy because Jews and Samaritans were enemies. And the Samaritan picked him up and put him on a donkey and took him to a place and dressed his wounds. We know the story. You see, you, can, if, if you, you could have your belief 100% correct, but if you're not behaving right, it's really for nothing. And you can be behaving right, and if you don't know what you believe, it's really for nothing. So it's important that we know what we believe and that we know how to behave. Okay, now this is all in the context of what... The Lord had spoke, and what the emphasis is about reaching out. Do you know this world that we're living in, uh, they call it the I generation. You know why they call it the I generation? iPods, iPads, (laughs) iPhones. And uh, how many of you you older folks can remember Dick Tracy in the comic book? Sunday morning comic strip, right? Sunday morning paper would come in, every big Dick Tracy. And he'd have his two-way wrist radio. Remember that two-way? And we thought, oh, man, this is just a comic strip. <laughs> now, yeah. you know, you can, you know, you got your little, you can watch a movie, you can talk, you can take pictures, you can. And it's, and it's changing exponentially. In other words, the, the, the amount of knowledge and stuff that we have it's not just like doubling so much. It's, it's multiplying. To whereas I thought that I was fairly with it. You know, I try to keep with it as far as stuff. But I see some of the stuff today and I scratch my head and say, what in the world is that? Yeah, right. And then I ask the question, why in the world do we need that? Why in the world do two kids sitting in the back seat of a car have to text to, to each other? A, friend, a guy told me that one time. He says, yeah, he says, my kid was in the back seat with his friends, and they were texting each other. <laughs> and you, you, get on, you get on, we have social media. You got so many friends that you, know, you don't even know. Right. Facebook friends. I got people asking me on Facebook. They say, be my friend. I, say, I don't even know who you are. <laughs> well, I know, you know, you have a cousin who has a second cousin who lives over here, and they, I saw your name there. I said, let's be friends. Let's be friends. You know, say, friend, you know, accept them as a friend. And I, how many friends? I got lots of friends. I just don't know who they are. <laughs> that's the way it is. That's, that's our society. So, so the idea is, in that context, how do we take the gospel message to that generation? The, the, gospel, the gospel hasn't changed. And we can't change it. We can't make this fit society. In fact, let me tell you this, it does fit society. Because the same problems they had back in Acts chapter 2, they got today. The I generation is the same as Pentecost generation. It's the same. The, the problem is sin. It's, it hasn't changed. It, it has different manifestations, but it hasn't changed. And the gospel message, you know, people, what they've tried to do, they've tried to change the message to meet the need in the world. Well, if we... If we de-emphasize the sin thing, because that's, <clears throat> this generation doesn't like to, we don't like to feel bad. We don't like to, you know, we don't like to alienate them by making them think we're judging them. Well, I'm not judging anybody, but it's, it's the word that judges. We can't change, we can't make the gospel fit society. I was just reading an article recently in, uh, Time magazine was talking about the Constitution of the United States of America. And they said, uh, you know, is the Constitution, I forgot how they put it, but basically, you know, when they wrote the Constitution, they didn't, they didn't think it was going to change. But they made, they, made, uh, 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 they made it possible to put amendments if you've got two-thirds of the states and so forth. But essentially what they said down in the Bill of Rights, that's, that's the way it is. But today we think, well, maybe we can take the Constitution and tweak it a little bit. To meet our needs. We're living in an age, listen, we're living in an age of chaos. That fellow was preaching Friday night and said, I don't mind telling you where I'm going to get some of this stuff. He was preaching Friday. He said, we're living in an age of chaos. 
chaos, uncontrolled mayhem. That's what's happening in our society. That's why the state of New York passes a law legalizing gay marriage. It's chaos. We, we disregard what God has to say as a society. And instead we call evil good and good evil. How do we take the gospel message and make it relevant or, or make them understand how relevant it is? Because a lot of people say today, well, that's from you know, 2,000 years ago and that's a bunch of you know, uh, judgmental stuff. And... No, it's not. Sin is still sin. Everybody still dies. And the blood of Jesus is still effective to wash us from our sins. Now, look, turn with me over to uh, 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, Paul's first letter to his friend and understudy, Timothy. I want you to read with me just a little bit. And we're not going to keep you long this morning. Well, I hope not. Paul was writing this young friend, Timothy. He said, Paul, this is chapter 1, starting at the very first verse, we'll start. Paul, an apostle of Jesus, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay. Verse 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus... When I went into Macedonia, that you might charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Paul left Timothy. If, if, again, if you read the book of Acts and you find out the history of these things. When Paul went into Ephesus, in the book of Acts, he began to preach. And there were, there were some disciples that came to him that were disciples of John the Baptist. And the Apostle Paul said, have you received the gift of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And they said, we haven't even heard of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So Paul prayed for them, baptized them in water, and they came up speaking with other tongues. They got filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues. That began a revival in Ephesus, and that's kind of a message in itself. But during that revival, they found out that Ephesus was a center where they worshipped a goddess named Diana. And, and what they... Uh, what a lot of the historians believe is that at one time a meteor came down and hit, uh, hit the earth around Ephesus, and they thought that was like something from the goddess Diana. So they built a shrine to Diana, a temple, and they worshipped that. And that was like the main religion of Ephesus, and that was like the main industry of Ephesus because they made a lot of money. It was like a, you know, a tourist thing. Let's go to the temple when they set their booths up, you know. So when... The Apostle Paul, when the, when the Holy Spirit started moving in Ephesus, now they didn't have the iPads, but they had the same mentality. When, when the Apostle Paul and uh, his entourage went into Ephesus, and he began to preach, people started getting saved, and we find out that all these people that got saved, these Gentiles, what they did was all their magic stuff, all their stuff from the worship of Diana and the, uh, the, the, uh, the religion of the... Of the uh, of the, of the Grecians and so forth. They, all their magic, they had a big bonfire. And everything that they had that was dedicated to other gods and goddesses, they burned on this bonfire. Big revival. Changed lives. They, they heard what they believed and they behaved accordingly. See, when, when you hear something and you believe what the Word says, we need to, learn, we need to let God help us behave accordingly. Like they did. They got saved, and they got rid of all their own old stuff. You know, I think back to when I got saved. And I have to say, God help me, if, if I would get saved today, I don't know if I would have reacted like I did back then. Because back then, when I got saved, I knew there was some stuff I had to get rid of. There were some things I had to throw away. Things that I had idolized. Things that had, that had become important in my life. Things that I really, really associated and identified with. And when I got saved, the Holy Spirit dealt with me and said, you need to get rid of these things. Most of you know, I've told a story before. I used to have like 2,000 record albums for some of you old enough to remember them. For you younger ones, they were like big black CDs, okay? They're all downstairs. Okay. <laughs> you have to out. God said, you need to get rid of that. And you know what? I didn't argue with them. 
I didn't say, oh, but God, I can sell my makeup. I, I didn't argue with him. I thought, now, now, if it was the, the way I feel today, sometimes I might have to say, well, Lord, you know, let me pray about this for a little bit. But the people in Ephesus, they, heard, they knew what they believed, and they didn't have to go to a four-year course uh, in, in, you know, to get, under, get this understanding. The Holy Spirit came. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. They knew what they believed, and they started to behave accordingly. And they were a witness to all the people in Ephesus. How did, they, how did they affect? They affected the people in Ephesus so much in such a powerful way that there was a riot because they quit buying the shrines, the things that they made for Diana. Uh, the, 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 the tourist trade started to go down because people started getting saved and they didn't want that stuff anymore. And there was a riot. You can read about it in the book of Acts. But their conversion had an effect on their society. Their salvation, what they believed, caused them to ha behave in a way that had an effect on the people out in society. Let's read on a little bit more. He says, I, I, I left you in Ephesus, verse 3, that you might charge some that they teach no other doctrine, but give heed, uh, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. What they would do was, they would, they would dig up, uh, when he's talking about genealogies, if you read the Bible, there are certain genealogies of Jesus Christ, okay? Well, some of the Jewish, some of the Jewish rabbis, they got so caught up, they, they had their, their own version of, of the Bible code. Have you ever heard the Bible code? Looking for secret messages in the Bible. Forget about looking for secret messages in the Bible. Look at the things that are there up front. Those are the important things. But there were those back then where they would get, this, get the Scriptures, and again, the Old Testament, and they would look for secret messages and secret patterns and secret things, just like they do today. They're, they're looking for something, something secret. Paul told Timothy, he said, listen, tell them to stop that. Stop that. That doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. We get so caught up sometimes in... in in doctrinal little things, and we get all, you know, we get all bent out of shape about this and that and everything else. It doesn't do anything to save anybody's soul. The gospel is pretty plain. And, and those things that we get wrapped up in, they're not going to change anybody's life. I want a gospel that's going to change my life. I want a gospel that's going to change the way I behave. Somebody says amen. <laughs> the people who knew me before I was saved, before I was saved is amen. Okay. Verse 5. Now the end of the commandment is this. Now this, this is the purpose. When we believe, what we believe, the doctrine that we believe, it has a purpose. The end of the commandment is charity or love. That's what that word is, agape. What we believe should cause us to love. What we, when we get a hold of the faith, when we believe this word, and by faith we accept what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us, it should cause us to love. Sad to say, too often it causes people to hate. You know what? Hatred. God reserves for Himself hatred. There are things that God hates. And I believe, if you take it to the extreme, I believe there are some people that God hates. He'd be willing to save them if they, if they would accept His Son. But it says in the, fifth, in the fifth Psalm, it says, God hates the workers of iniquity. That's kind of scary. You don't hear that preached too much. He so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish. But a part of Him hates the workers of iniquity. He reserves that for Himself. You know what? He doesn't give us that right. As believers. Now listen. There's, you, sometimes you hear things, and you see things, you hear about people doing things, and you say, I'd like to, mm. because we have emotions like God has, doesn't it? But you know what? There's not one person outside, on the other side of that door, that does not deserve to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't care where or why, if they're in prison or why they're there, I don't care. I don't care what they've done. I don't care who, how many lives they've ruined. There's nobody that does not deserve to hear the gospel. Praise the Lord. Go ahead. Play. Because the end of the commandment is love. I love a pure heart 
and of a good conscience, and of sincere faith. Well, you can spend a lot of time on those three things. A pure, blessed are the pure in heart. Isn't that what Jesus said? I want to tell you something. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, beloved believers, we need to examine our hearts. You know something that, I was, that God has impressed upon me about me? I'll just show you what he's impressed about me. Sometimes I, I sense and feel that the things I do might not be done out of a pure heart. Sometimes we do things out of a sense of pride, out of a sense of accomplishment, out of a sense that we want somebody to pass on the back and say, good job. Uh, but listen, if we do it for any other reason, the only thing that's going to count in our eternal bank account is what we do out of love for Him and out of love for His people. If we do it because, you know, Paul, the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians, he said, there's some people out there that are preaching the gospel because they want to, they want to make me mad at them. They want to have contention. You know, they want to be in competition. Paul said, I don't care as long as the gospel's preached. <laughs> well, I wonder how many pastors could say that if somebody tries to <laughs> raid their church. <laughs> you know, well, it's as long as the gospel's preached. Oh, that'll be a, truly a spiritual man. Okay. Love out of a pure heart. We need to be doing, we need to say, God, give me a pure heart. Give me a desire to reach the lost. Not because I want to, you know, I want to win the award for bringing more people to church. But give me a desire to preach the lost just because you loved them and died for them. A pure heart. Oh, our hearts, listen, my, our hearts can be so wicked. We can have so many different agendas for why, why we do what we do. I got an email from a guy. But there, there's a place on the internet called Whole Note. It's a guitar thing. And uh, I have a couple of lessons. I put a couple of like, things on there, lessons. And this guy sent me an email. He's from Australia. He says, oh, he says, I see that you're, I see that you're a pastor. He says, I thought about going into, going into the ministry one time. My dad wouldn't let me. He wanted me to go be a lawyer or something. And he says, my, my dad wouldn't let me. He says, but, but he says uh, something to the effect of, you know, it's a good profession. If you want to go into the ministry because you think it's a profession, go sell insurance. Please. Do you know how many people get into the ministry because they think it's a helping profession? I can help people. Go help them. Go join a food bank somewhere. It's not about, it's not a helping thing. It's about Jesus. A pure heart. Why do we do what we do? Why do we come to church? It's a pure heart. Do you know there's some folks that come to church just to cause trouble? <laughs> Not in this church. What we believe and how we behave. If you don't want to be behave according to what you believe, stay home. <laughs> The half the place is going to be empty next week. That's all right. You know, that's okay. Because I've said this before. I'm not here because I like coming up here talking on a Sunday morning. I don't really particularly like to talk in front of people. I don't. You ask people who knew me years ago, I never said nothing. I don't know why I'm shooting my mouth off now. All right. The end of the commandment is charity. Out of a pure heart, and out of a good conscience, can we honestly, and, and you, yourself, because I have to look at myself, can I honestly stand up and say, I've not done anybody wrong, and I, I have no grudge against any man? A good conscience. You can say what you want to about me, but can I sit here and say whatever you say about me is going to be a lie if it's bad? I mean, you might not like me. That's okay. I, you know. In, in other places in the scripture, it talks about being above reproach. Do we take our responsibility to Christ serious enough to live lives that are above reproach? That your neighbor won't be able to point to you and say, yeah, I know him. I see what he does in the backyard. Yeah. A clear conscience. 
You know what it's like to have a guilty conscience, don't you? We all do. You ever done something wrong? And you got that thing in your mind? You have the Holy Spirit. See, as a matter of fact, let me tell you this. If you don't have a guilty conscience once in a while, you're in trouble. They call them sociopaths. If you, if, if, you, if you can't feel guilty, if you can't do something wrong and not feel guilty about it, they call you a sociopath. You're in trouble. That means you're doing wrong and you don't know you're doing wrong. You know, it's one thing if I do wrong, I know it. Not going to ask forgiveness to do what I got to do. <laughs> no, I'm not going. To. I was going to say something, probably get me in trouble, and I'm not going to say it. Okay, the end of the commandment: charity out of a pure heart, and of a good conscience, and of sincere faith. What we believe, what we believe, how we behave. How how many when when you read something like this, and and. You're impressed. I hope we're all impressed. You know, on the door going out is a sign that says, now entering the mission field. It's been there for a long time. I hope we're all impressed in this church with the word that God gave us this morning, which was according to the word that I was going to, I'm giving. I hope we're all impressed that we have a responsibility to the lost. We can't save them. I can't save anybody. But it's my responsibility to bear the good news to anybody who will give me an ear to listen. It will not be well accepted all the time. It will be rejected. It will be scorned. It will be mocked. It was back then. But am I ready? With a sincere heart, a pure heart, a clean conscience, and with sincere faith. To behave the way my faith tells me I ought to. To know what I believe and act like it. And take this message to people who are dying and going to hell. That's what we're called to do. Reading a little bit more. Now the end of the commandment, verse 5 again, is charity out of a pure heart and of good conscience and of faith and fame. Which some having swerved uh, from, from which uh, some having swerved have turned unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. There are those people, uh, there, are, there are preachers and teachers who have a form of, they, they sound like they know what they're talking about. But how are they living? I got a thing in an email the other day about some guy that's coming with gold dust. Huh? You know, oh, man, got this stuff going on. I don't care if they make everybody float. I want to know how they're living. I want to know if they're behaving the way their faith tells them they ought to behave. I want to know if they're preaching what this word says. I don't care what they can do. All signs of wonder, man, people will flock to people that got some kind of thing. You know, there are people that have this stigma of blood coming out of their hands. Oh, people want to go and get healed. Well, you, you can get healed and end up in hell. I'm not going to get too... Desiring to be teachers of the law, look at these people. They want to teach the law. They want to have. They want to teach the word. They want to be teachers, but they don't understand what they're talking about. How many people stand up and preach God's word, and they'll, they'll pull one or two verses out, and they'll go on and on and on, and tell stories about this and that? And yeah, I remember I went up to heaven. I went down to hell. I went this here. I went here, there, and everything, thing else. But but they don't know what they're talking about. They ought to learn what this word says, and they, they don't have to make stories up. I don't want to hear stories. I mean, if you want to give me your testimony, that's fine. That's, testimonies are good. Testimonies of how God saved you and changed you, that's a good thing. But we hear all these stories, you know, this one, that one, everything. I don't need to hear stories. I don't need to read books about somebody that went up and saw, you know, uh, you know people sitting around heaven. I, this is what I need. I don't need nothing, nothing other than this. Because, the, you know what, that stuff, that stuff isn't going to teach me how to behave. 
This is going to teach me how to live. This is going to change me. Okay, listen to what he says. I'm... They desire to be teachers of the law. They don't understand what, the, what they're saying. And they don't really know what they're, what they're preaching. But we know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient. He was talking about people who are trying to dig up the Old Testament laws and trying to impose on people standards that they couldn't keep. I couldn't keep the Old Testament law. There's like there's something like 340 of them. He says the law is given when God gave the Ten Commandments. He gave them to show us what's wrong with us. So that we would call upon the name of Jesus. The law was a schoolmaster to teach us about salvation. See, some people take it out of, out of context. They'll give you, they'll say, you got to do this, this, that. And if you step out of line and... Listen to what he says. I'm coming. I, I really want to just get down to this one verse. Knowing this, verse 9, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless, the disobedient, the ungodly, and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to what? Sound doctrine. There's a big long list of ugly stuff there. And I guarantee you that before I was saved, I was in there somewhere. And so were you. The law was given to convict us of our sin. There's no salvation in the law. You go all through the Old Testament. There were provisions made for making offerings and sacrifices and so forth. But the law was written in stone. Ten Commandments are written. This can't be changed. And we all fall short. We all fall in this, this group of folks here. It says in verse 11, According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust, Paul says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Thank God for his grace that when we were unsaved, that when we were blasphemers, that when we were uh, whoremongers, uh, men stealers, all these other things, defiling themselves with mankind, or somewhere we, we fit in that group. When we were as wicked and vile, horrible sinners as anybody, God in His grace showed us His love on the cross with Jesus Christ shedding His blood. And thank God that by the power of His Holy Spirit and the mercy of God, He drew us. Somebody was willing to tell us about Jesus. Somebody was willing to give us a tract. Somebody was willing to open up our mouth and tell us, to warn us from the judgment that is to come. And thank God, through His grace, we were able to respond by accepting the gift of Jesus Christ. Do you know where you came from? There's a lot of people that forget where they come from. Notice what he says. Verse 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus toward Paul and toward us. Now listen, here's, I said all that to say just this one verse. This is our mandate. They said, the, 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 the catchphrase is engaging the missional mandate. Remember I talked to you about buzzwords? They come up with buzzwords. Missional mandate is a big buzzword now. All it means is this. We're commanded by Jesus to go. You might not be commanded to go to Africa. You might not be commanded to go to South America. But you might be commanded to go to Kenneth Avenue. You might be commanded to go to the laundromat. You might, wherever you are, God has commanded us to go. That's a mission. We're mandated to take this gospel to a lost and dying world. Every one of us. The name's the name of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. If you're not saved, you're not mandated. You don't have anything to bring. But if you're counting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then listen, you're mandated to take this gospel out to the world and not only to speak it, but to live it. Because quite frankly, just let me say this. I get tired of running into people and knowing people that say, yeah, I'm saved, yeah. 
And they live like the devil. And they don't give two hoots about what Jesus thinks about nothing until they come in church on Sunday morning. I'm kind of tired of that. Because they go out and they tell people, yeah, I'm a Christian, yeah, I'm born again. And they act just like the world. And the world looks at them and says, who are you? See that behavior thing? We talk about the belief, that's cool, but we talk about behavior and we start getting a little... They need to hear the gospel and they need to see the gospel. I can't, it baffles me. Rose and I, uh, we were at the camp meeting. And a good friend of mine, who pastors a church on the other end of the state, he wasn't there. He said, boy, I wonder where so-and-so is. And I went up to Luann, church secretary, and I said, Luann, I said, where's a... She said, well, he resigned his church. And I said, what happened? Because he said, because he had, he, he had a bout with, like, cancer. I said, what happened? And, he, and she said, well, I can't say. She says, if you want to know, talk to the overseer, talk to one of the council members. She says, I'm really not supposed to ask. I said, okay. I didn't ask. What are we thinking? And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that, oh, I'm Mr. Perfect. But when a person gets to a place of ministry, don't we understand that we're held responsible? When you go out there and proclaim that you're a Christian, you might not be as held as responsible as I am being up here, but you're held responsible for how you behave, for the, for the Jesus that you show them. Sure, you can tell them about Jesus, but what are you showing them? It goes hand in hand. And every one of us, we're at some kind of level. Some of us have been doing this for a long time. And we've learned, and we've learned to mature, and we've learned to, you know, allow the grace of God to come and help us live lives. And, and we can, we, you know, people look at us and say, yeah, there's a, there's a good Christian man. And some of us, maybe we're just saved recently, or whatever, we're, we're, we're on some scale. But God help us have a desire to want to go to the next step. Wherever I am, wherever you are, don't you want to go to the next step? Growing in grace. This is a faithful saying in verse 15. And worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Paul adds, of whom I am chief. That's the purpose of Christ. That's the purpose of the church. That's the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's the purpose of everything that we do. That's why we gather together. That's why we have community in a congregation. We come together and pray for each other and support each other and encourage one another, sometimes admonish one another. It's all for the purpose of being able to lead somebody to Jesus Christ. I want to show you one more thing, and we're going to close, I promise. Second Peter, read this with me. Chapter 1. We're starting with verse 2. And just, this is a message in itself, and you know, maybe we'll talk about some other time. But just, just read this and study this yourself when you get a chance. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 2. He writes, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. If you're saved, don't tell me, well, I don't think I can do that because God gives you the power to do it. By faith. It's not willpower. It's not buying the right book. It's not, God gives you the power to do it. He says, uh, things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Okay? Now there's a whole message right there, but look at verse 5. See, ask yourself where you are on this. This is like a scale of like 1 to 10. Okay? See where you are on this scale. And besides this, giving all diligence to add to your faith, we start with faith, don't we? Virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. 
and to knowledge, temperance, or self-control. Oh, you mean, you mean we ought to be, self-control, this, that's part of the step here. And to self-control, patience. Patience is the first thing, thank God. Okay, but it comes, all right. And to patience, godliness. Godliness. At living and acting like God would have us to do. Ooh. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity or love. Brotherly kindness is the phileo love. That's the love, you know, fellowship, koinonia type love that we have. The agape love is the selfless giving love. Now, that's what, we could do a whole message. In fact, I have and maybe will do a whole message on all that. But I just want to ask you, looking at those words, and those words are pretty much self-explanatory, where are you on that scale? Some folks get saved, and the Holy Spirit does a work, man, and they shoot right up. And some folks are saved for years, and they're still wrestling with their faith. Where are you? In the, in the I generation that we live in, they need to see sincere, growing, honest, spirit-filled, anointed believers living their lives according to this word, not perfect, because none of us are, or ever will be, but they need to see the representatives of Jesus Christ Sincere, pure heart, sincere faith, going out with a, a desire to save the lost. That's what, that's what church is about. That's what Christianity is about. That's what we're called to do. It's a challenge. But you know what? If those folks back there in Acts could do it, See, we're not in a position yet that anybody wants to throw us in jail for it. Not yet. This thing that happened up in New York State, I'm anxious to see how that's going to play out. With hate speech? Come on. You... See, we're not, we're, not, we're, not, we're not threatened with jail time yet for our faith. They were back in Acts chapter 2. They not only got thrown in jail, but they didn't have the ACLU back then. They got beat up. We're not threatened with that yet. Not on an official level. But if we were, how many would stand? I want to ask you this morning, would you stand? Would you stand for the gospel? If you were threatened, if a government agency came and said, you better stop preaching like that, you better stop saying, you better stop handing them tracts out, would you stand and do it? I want you to stand with me this morning as we close in prayer. That's the missional mandate. We'll be hearing in, in weeks to come about, you know, world missions. Our, our, our brother John Shelton is just coming back from uh, Alabama. He was, he was down there on a, on a mission, mission work there. Uh, but where you're at, where you live, where your house is, where you park your car, are you living according to what you believe? I want to pray this morning. I just want to pray for God to send His anointing on us. You know, I need His anointing. I need His anointing. I need, I need, I need God's fire. Not just to be here, but out there. And you do too. You need God's fire. You need God's touch. If you're going to be a witness for Jesus Christ, you need God's touch. I'm praying this morning. God spoke this morning His Word to us about going out. Stop squabbling with one another and realize what the call is, what the, what the purpose is. Now are we willing to go? Are we willing to go? Let's pray. Father, 
We need you so much. Father, you have called us to be witnesses in our town, our community, our surrounding area, our county, our state, our nation, wherever you might send us. You've called us to be witnesses. Father, it says in your word that you will anoint us, that you will empower us to be witnesses for you. We can't do it in our own strength. We can't do it with our own intelligence. But God, we need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit to be able to be your witnesses. God, there are people that walk up and down the street every day. They walk in front of my house. They walk, they walk these streets. And wherever we live, some of us live in this community, some of us live in other towns, villages around. Wherever we live, there are people that walk past our streets every day on different levels of of life. Some of them are, are fairly well to do. Some of them are, are addicted. W w Father, you know every, each and every one of them was created in your image. There's not a single one of them that don't deserve to hear your gospel. Some may be resistant. Some may be, they, they're not ready for that yet. Father, whatever, we've heard all the reasons. We've used, some of us have used all them reasons. Father, we need an anointing from the Holy Spirit to be able to share your gospel to these people that walk up and down these streets, up and down the alleys, in front of our house, whatever city we live in, the people that we work with, the people that we deal with every day. We need an anointing from the Holy Spirit to be able to share your word that they might be brought into the kingdom of God. That they might be saved. Not so we can get a pat on the back or we can get some kind of a war, but so that you could be glorified in their, in their saved lives. Father, help us. Every one of us ask you this, ask you for this this morning. God, give me a pure heart. God, give me a clear conscience. And give me sincere faith that I may manifest your love. That as I learn your word, I understand what I believe, I will be able to manifest it in the way I behave. And be an effective witness for you. And I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would move in us. That when we share your word, when we show your word, that the people would sense and feel your word. It wouldn't just be what they hear or what they see, but they would sense a presence of God on us. That we can't generate, we can't make it happen. All we can do is say, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Anoint me with your Holy Ghost. That when I go forth to preach your word, it won't be my words, it will be your words. It won't be my heart, it'll be your heart. It won't be my wisdom, it'll be your wisdom. Hallelujah. Father, I pray you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Give us the gifts of the Spirit. Not to be used, not to just sound good, but Father, for the purpose of building up the body of Christ. Father, help us be your witnesses. Father, I want to pray. Let the Lord convict you. Ask yourself how you're living. It's not for me. Ask yourself how you're living. When you go outside this door, ask yourself, Lord, how am I living? Am I living the way you want me to live? Do I lie? Do I, do I cheat? Do I connive? Do I make trouble? Do I, yeah, Lord, show me. Show me how I'm living. See, it's, it's, my, uh, it's my, dis my very uh, distinct opinion that we all know how we're living. It's not well, like we'll just wake up one day and say, well, oh, man, I've been doing this. You know what you're doing. Because I do too. God, give us, help us be holy. Father, fill us with your Holy Spirit that he would make us holy. That the world will hear and see I don't want to play church. I don't want to pre pretend. I don't want to just come here on a Sunday morning because it's the thing to do. Father, I want to be about 
your business. And I can only do it if I'm filled with your Holy Ghost. God, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Father, I pray you would give us the evidence of the infilling of the Holy Spirit with the gifts and the speaking in tongues. Father, anoint us and fill us with your glory and use us for your glory. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Just give him, you know what, open up your mouth and praise him this morning. Just praise him. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. We don't, we don't have to hype them up. Because if you read about that early church, they studied the apostles' doctrine. They broke bread. They fellowshiped with one another. They shared everything. And God moved. If we get the word right, if we get our belief right and our behavior right, I believe God will come. Don't you? He'll come. That's what the Word says. He'll come. Amen? Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. We're going to close in prayer. And uh, as, as always, if you need prayer for anything, please come up here and stick around a few minutes as I shake a few hands. But, uh, and we'd be happy to pray with you. Myself is here, Brother D-Roy, uh, Brother Io, and we would we, we love to pray with you, Brother Chuck. We would love to pray with you. Uh, my wife, okay? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you. You have given us a mandate. You've given us promises, precious promises. As we go from this place with not your presence, Father, help us go forth, spreading the gospel, telling somebody about Jesus this week. And we thank you and we give you glory in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, amen. amen. Shake somebody's hand and greet each other.